I'm going to talk a bit about uh, print collecting in the uh, early 18th century after two, um, two broad talks uh, over the last couple of weeks. I'm going to try to go in and focus quite closely on, uh, on, on the early 18th century and in particular on the collection of George Clark that I worked on. Um, there's quite a lot of overlap, it seems to me, between Clark's collection and the collection, the Robinson collection at Armagh. Um, that collection, the Robinson collection, seems to me from a brief look to stop dead about 1776. Clark stops dead in 1736 when he dies. So they're possibly 40 years apart, although possibly some of the Robinson collection may have been bought at around the same time that Clark was working. Uh, Clark's an interesting man. His father was assistant secretary to the New Model Army um, and then to the Commonwealth. It was he who took the shorthand notes of the Putney debates, uh, but then he became secretary to General Monk and as such was instrumental in, um, in achieving the restoration. Uh, he became secretary of war effectively to Charles II and was killed during the four days naval battle against the Dutch off Harwich. So Clark hardly, George Clark hardly knew his father. He was brought up his mother remarried to one of the king's doctors and uh, Clark had a reasonably illustrious career, fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. He took over his father's job as judge advocate and then was secretary at war in Ireland, as such he was with King William at the Battle of the Boyne uh, and stayed to secure peace in Ireland. Um, secretary at war in England, uh, thrown out when the Whigs came into power, but when the Tories got back in in 1710, uh, he was Lord of the Admiralty to the end of Anne's reign, didn't like the Hanoverians, was out of office thereafter, but was a commissioner for building the new churches and an MP for most of his career. So this is Clark on the left. Uh, and on the right is the building that he designed with help from Hawksmoor for his library. Uh, and below it, the library as it appears today with the books on cases along one side and at each end. Um, and this is the plan for the library that Clark and Hawksmoor together designed uh, in 1720. He was uh, hugely interested in architecture and instrumental in a lot of the new building that took place. And there was a lot of new building taking place in the early 18th century. Uh, as a secretary to the as, uh, Lord of the Admiralty, he was, uh, he was took part in building Greenwich Hospital. Uh, as I said, he was a commissioner for the new churches. And in Oxford, along with um, sometimes where he was often initiating projects, often producing initial designs, then usually consulted Hawksmoor uh, and also worked with William Townsend, but he was effectively responsible for promoting and carrying through building at Queen's College at All Souls, the Clarendon building, the Radcliffe camera he had part in, uh, as well as his, his own house that he built in All Souls, houses for one or two others, uh, and Worcester College. So, I mean, as you can imagine, his print collection uh, takes a great interest in architecture, and probably he's using it uh, as an aid in his architectural interests in the way that Anthony suggested last week. Certainly he's commissioning prints in the way that Anthony mentioned last week um, to circulate amongst interested parties in order to raise money for, um, for, uh, for buildings. And this is probably one such. As well as Hawksmoor, uh, he worked with another promising English painter-designer Sir James Thornhill. Um, 
He probably played a part in the choice of Thornhill for de uh, decorating the cupola of St Paul's. Uh, he certainly commissioned Thornhill to design the um, statues on the roof of the Clarendon building, the printing press in Oxford. Um, and uh, Thornhill designed uh, the Oxford Almanac for 1720 around his designs for that building with the Clarendon building in the background uh, and the original drawings for both of those are in Clark's collection that's Clark's handwriting um, this is the original drawing so what was in the collection well first of all we'll get the Dutch out of the way this is a print showing the uh, Duke of Albemarle's house at Zutphen but it's in an album that's almost entirely English you get a little bit of a sense of the way the album's composed in this case just prints bound in without backing paper um usually there is backing paper sorry i just went a bit too fast there. um he bought this print along with a whole load of others on a visit to amsterdam in 1706 uh but really there's very little Dutch and Flemish material, except what represents Rome or France, in Clark's collection. For instance, there's one print after Rembrandt. There are a couple of quite decent jurors, but he's just not interested in that kind of thing. Had he lived a little bit longer, uh, he might well have gone far more towards um, Holland and Flanders which became much more fashionable as did Rembrandt uh, hugely fashionable in the 1740s but he belongs to an earlier generation that is interested in France and in Italy chiefly and by god he knew his way around Paris uh, it's the most amazing document of virtual travel a Clark's collection and that's a theme that I'd like you to keep in mind um, this is one of four huge plans that all several feet by several feet um, of Paris this one effectively an A to Z giving you all you know it's a street map giving you all the locations using these things you can place every important building every important house every church the location of every significant painting and statue in Paris. Very helpful if you're visiting and um, Clark spent three months in France in 1715 and we know that quite a number of things were bought on, on location in Paris. Uh, for instance this, he certainly went to uh, Versailles uh, and although he had earlier views of Versailles that uh, were part of the Cabinet du Roi, the famous collection started by Colbert uh, documenting the great achievements cultural and military of Louis XIV uh, but he probably bought this in 1715 uh, published in 1714 and therefore the latest and most up-to-date coverage of the gardens of Versailles which were quite something. This uh, six sheet uh, map, um, bird's eye, bird's eye plan, um, which is three feet by five feet if you lay it all out on, on sheets on the, uh, on the floor of the library in Worcester College or in Clark's uh, study at All Souls. Um, gives you some sense of the vastness and the grandeur that was Versailles, seen from the orangery um, with the, the uh, palace and the buildings for the courtiers on the right, uh, on the left, the bosque, uh, the parterres in the center to the back of the palace, um, and in the distance, the park stretching almost as far as the eye can see. It is impressive stuff, French achievement in the 17th century. Um, 
We know also that Clark uh, visited Fontainebleau because uh, he bought the guide to it and uh, noted that he had he'd been there. Similarly, the, the Machine de Marly is noted in Clark's handwriting that he bought it on the spot. Um, this is one of Israel Silvestre's uh, view of Fontainebleau uh, and Clark owned a huge series of views of the gardens and houses of, uh, of France. Uh, and there is another very, very long series uh, by Perel. Um, and this is his view of Vaux le Vicomte, um, showing, uh, showing André Le Notre's gardens. Uh, possibly even more crowded with tourists than we are led to believe than it is today. Um, lovely formal gardens, but they, they each of these views documents the appearance of, of a house. The clerk will then usually also have the elevation of the same building. Uh, he'll probably have whatever paintings were inside it. You'll probably have whatever statuary was in the garden and a view of the garden. Um, using this, you do you can just recreate the whole the whole of France. Uh, this is a uh, this print comes from uh, the Grand Marot, which recorded um, Jean Marot's uh, architecture. Again, uh, Clark annotates it uh, that he bought it in um, in Paris when he was there in 1715. Uh, I ought to apologise for the uh, slides which are generally drawn from the British Museum's collection rather than from Clark's collection where they're Clark's, they're the old tatty photographs uh, reproduced. Um, but I'll explain that as we go along. Uh, he has vast numbers of these little uh, books of, uh, of of decoration, they usually take the form of a little pamphlet stitched together um, originally uh, in sort of six or eight sheets or sometimes 12 sheets uh, and you'll get six vases or uh, in the case of the thing on the right, six coaching doors, entrances for coaches. Uh, there are panels, there are altars, there are you name it, he's got it, Bull's Furniture, and he has a huge series of these, which he can at least use for reference of, of, of just what is being done, what is most up to date in France, possibly transfer it to his English work. So that's the architectural side, but Clark is also interested in paintings. Um, The first, uh, Poussin is very, very, very highly regarded at this date. Uh, Florent Le Comte published a catalogue in 1699-1700 uh, listing about 200 of Poussin's prints, although a lot of those are duplicates. Um, Poussin's sacraments were, were engraved several times over in different sizes. Uh, but Clark has a sequence of 68 of the best of them forming a, a, in one volume uh, or in a section of one volume, effectively forming an oeuvre of Poussin. Um, the big one on the right is the British Museum's example of the first state. Uh, the little one on the left uh, is from the Albertina, uh, but is the second state that Clark owned, still published by Claudine Stella, um, but with the coat of arms added. Uh, he had quite a lot of Claudine Stella and Jean Pen, possibly the two best interpreters of, of Poussin. And these things are huge, usually in Clark's case with full margins, um, Anthony was describing last week how many old master prints uh, are inset, uh, cut to thread margins. Um, one or two of Clark's old master prints are also uh, inset, and most of them are cut to thread margins. But for his modern prints, he prefers full sheets of Grand Aigle where he can get them, uh, and most of his prints are on full sheets. 
Uh, this is the most famous uh, French print of the lot at that date. Um, Gerard Edelink's uh, engraving of, of the tent of Darius, which forms the first of the series of five uh, battles of Alexander that were take pride of place in the Cabinet du Roi, uh, the record of the paintings, uh, well, in this case, the paintings, the Cabinet du Roi records everything um, created by uh, Louis XIV. Um, Colbert, uh, who uh, thought up this enterprise, employed André Félibien uh, to write the introductions and describe them, and, and Félibien talks about how printmaking is an invention that allows modern uh, Europe to uh, improve on antiquity because in antiquity they didn't have prints and prints can make a permanent record of everything all the great works of the king of France and his engravers to pass on to posterity to show to different nations prints are hugely important for this uh, enterprise of national record and um, national promotion. Uh, uh, and then uh, um, in another dimension, this is one of the great prints. Lebrun is supposed to be very good at expression. We look at the mixed expressions of fear and imploring on the faces of the queens of Persia on the left who have just uh, mistaken Hephaestion for Alexander and expecting Alexander to get very cross about this but Alexander is thoroughly merciful and charming to them all. Um, this moment captured by Gerard Edeling, the supreme engraver of the period in France. Uh, later on, um, these, these paintings become hugely, uh, uh, hugely well known, hugely celebrated. Félibien's pamphlet was translated um, into English uh, later on by William Parsons, um, and Parsons illustrated it with a uh, with a copy of the Tent of Darius that Simon Gribelin, um, Huguenot in Grover, had settled in England, uh, uh, engraved as a, as a copy, a fine but much, much smaller uh, copy of Edeling's print. Um, so, yes, so that, uh, so that you can understand what he's talking about, he's in, put the print in as a frontispiece. Um, from the days of Lebrun uh, and Mignard, Clark follows the progress of French cultural achievement uh, through to Antoine Coipel, who is the senior painter around um, 1720, and is again engaged on uh, huge decorative schemes. Um, for painting the ceilings of houses, in this case the Grand Galerie uh, of the Palais Royal, the home of the Duke d'Orléans, um, and you will have pictures of the Palais Royal, pictures of the sculpture in the gardens, pictures of the, of the Duke d'Orléans uh, collection, and so on. Um, yes, these are engraved by Etienne Picard, uh, another Huguenot, who eventually left France uh, and worked in Amsterdam, um, and a lot of French, uh, a lot of French painting was copied in Amsterdam, uh, lettered in French, usually for international distribution. Some of that reaches England more cheaply than the French originals. Um, this one is published in both Amsterdam and um, uh, and in Paris by Gaspard Duchange. Um, you often get this kind of international co-publication at this date. Uh, and yeah, Clark had 45 uh, prints after Quapel as a kind of a kind of oeuvre. You're beginning to see developing during this period the idea of collecting painters, collecting 
by designer. Um, so, uh, uh, Le Comte in, um, in, in 1700 is encouraging you to collect an oeuvre of Raphael by listing everything that there is to be bought after Raphael, an oeuvre of Lebrun by doing the same with Lebrun, an oeuvre of Poussin, um, and uh, you see the beginning of, of, of uh, collecting by designer, uh, something that I think becomes stronger during the 18th century uh, in Clark's collection. Uh, and he follows all the way through, still buying uh, to the point, uh, still buying until shortly before his death. Uh, and you will see from the bad photograph here that this is actually one of Clark's prints. Um, lovely sheet of paper. You can see the texture from the way it was photographed. Um, fresh impression. Look at the depth of the plate mark uh, on a full sheet of paper. Um, has sold and preserved in the album as sold. Uh, and again, he has a, a not a huge number of prints by Vato, but. Um, but a, a beautiful little representation uh, of, of Vato. Uh, and then we go to Rome, um, where the situation is rather different. Uh, nearly everything published in Rome, with the exception of the work of a few, few separate artists, uh, can be got from Giovanni Giacomo de Rossi and his firm, who almost monopolized uh, everything that uh, uh, that shows ancient and modern Rome. And they ruthlessly reprint old plates that are in their stock. So this is another huge eight sheet um, view, bird's eye view uh, of ancient Rome. Uh, as imagined or recorded, uh, I don't quite know the quality of the observation, uh, by Etienne Duperac, and originally issued in 1574, um, but Clark will have bought it, well, no earlier than 1674, and more probably rather later. Um, And this beautiful thing on the right is uh, a 12 sheet bird's eye view of um, modern Rome as it was, I think in about 1690, uh, by Jean-Baptiste Falda, uh, who produced views of uh, vast numbers of buildings in, in Rome that Clark has. Uh, but again, it's street by street. Uh, on the left, uh, it, it, the little detail is, is more or less actual size, showing the Piazza Navona, and you can see how every um, uh, every house is uh, depicted, uh, and that there is a key to them, uh, which is the sort of text at the bottom left and bottom right. Uh, so you really can find your way around and feel that you know Rome street by street, house by house, edifice by edifice, even if, like Clark, you never actually manage to make it to Rome yourself. Um, his friend Edward Southall wrote to him in 1726 saying that he, Southall, had just spent three months amongst Rome's ancient and modern curiosities, um, saying that he had taken no small pains in hopes to obtain as full a knowledge of them as you who have never been here. Clark's knowledge of Rome is based entirely on his print collection, but his print collection provides him expertise, virtual expertise in everything in Rome. Uh, here is a much bigger view of the Piazza Navona um, by Gaspar Wouters, uh, as it was in 1693, with a fabulous statue and the uh, Pamphili Palace, as opposed to the Pamphili Doria Palace, it's hugely muddling, um, on the left. Uh, kind of view that um, 
well, is the immediate is the immediate antecedent of Piranesi. You you can see certain certain stylistic elements of Piranesi there, but sadly Clark didn't live long enough for Piranesi. Otherwise, he would have had the lot. The same building uh, as an art uh, an architectural elevation. Um, Clark is fully aware of all the works of the great Renaissance architects in Rome because he has elevations of them all like this one. Uh, this Amphili Palace completed for Innocent the in 1560. And this is the decorated gallery uh, of, of the Pamphili Palace uh, as decorated by uh, Pietro de Cortona. Um, and published in 1670, once again, like almost everything else, by uh, Giacomo de Rossi, or his heir, Domenico de Rossi. Um, and in this case, it's a series of fairly indifferent uh, etchings by Carlo Cesio. Um, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the buildings like the Barberini Palace, or you know, you will have a, a small volume of about 20 prints uh, representing the whole thing in, in detail. And um, Clark generally has them all. Uh, he also covered other Italian cities. There's the odd view of Livorno, which became British HQ in Italy. Uh, but more especially he's interested in, in Venice and has uh, a series of sets uh, documenting the changing appearance of Venice at different times. Um, Valentin Lefebvre, Luca Carlovaris, Domenico Levisa, uh, and this the first uh, representation of uh, Canaletto's work uh, dedicated to the British consul Joseph Smith. Uh, and the first volume published just before Clark's death. He doesn't, of course, have the second two. Um, beautiful work, and, and it's, it's, I love the detail, people hanging out washing. Um, it's, it's gorgeous. You get a lot of, of Venetian life as well as Venetian architecture in these uh, sets, and two of them are partly dedicated to the architecture, partly dedicated to the famous paintings in Venice. Um, uh, and we'll show you which house, which palace or church you had to go to to see them. Again, virtual travel. Uh, and switching from uh, Paris and Rome, Clark's third main collection. Uh, is England, Britain, though largely London. Um, and uh, here he's quite often an active agent in getting things done. Um, as I suggested earlier, he probably had some responsibility for uh, Thornhill's uh, paintings in the Cupola of St Paul's on the right. He has about three sets of the prints well, he knew Thornhill quite well, and Thornhill probably gave him at least one. Uh, but it may be that he, he actually he played a part in their creation. Sorry, it's a bit too early. Um, um, and on, on the left is um, uh, Nicolas Dorigny's uh, planetarium uh, after um, Raphael, uh, Dorigny's reproductions of um, Raphael's designs for the Kigi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo uh, in 1695. Um, Nicola Dorigny uh, around 1700 and shortly after established himself a reputation as a great interpreter of Raphael with Raphael's transfiguration, which Clark also has. Uh, and other major Raphaels, uh, and he is eventually brought over to Britain, uh, to London, um, in order to engrave the most famous set of uh, things in uh, London, which are Raphael's uh, cartoons, tapestry cartoons, 
um, then at Hampton Court. Uh, and this becomes the most, the biggest, most ambitious, most expensive uh, undertaking of early 18th century England. Uh, eventually undertaken, it was going to be paid for by the Queen, but then the court didn't quite have the money and they launched a subscription for it, which becomes the great way of publishing things in England. You get several people to band together, combine their resources to publish. Uh, and uh, Dorini gets these things engraved. I think they're originally four guineas to subscribers for the set. Uh, and he excuses this enormous uh, sum by saying that at the moment, uh, the five battles of, uh, of Alexandra changing hands in London for 20 guineas. Uh, and Clark follows um, uh, English design, uh, he's heavily invested in George Virtue, uh, he buys most of the more ambitious uh, sets that are launched on the English market right up to his death in 1736. Uh, he has a subscription set of the Rake's Progress published just before he dies uh, and a lovely subscription set of the Harlot's Progress, of which this is an example, um, published a few years earlier. Uh, there is almost inevitably a portrait component in Clark's collection. I reckon his collection amounts to about 10,000 prints, but it's rather difficult to add up because a lot of them are long series in, in books and we probably never catalogued a lot. Um, he has, a, a, a as I say, a, the, the, perhaps about a thousand prints, um, about a thousand portraits tending to represent uh, friends uh, and uh, those who governed England and were influential in England during the career of his father, going back to the beginnings of the Civil War uh, and continuing through his own career as a, as a major civil servant. Um, it's, that's, that's the concentration uh, and with significant coverage of, of major French and Italian personalities of the, of the same period. Um, on the left, uh, uh, well, his impression is just about as good as this one uh, from the British Museum. Um, uh, uh, Inigo Jones, who he admired to the extent that he bought quite a lot of, uh, well, he bought Inigo Jones's library and um, a substantial number of designs and drawings by Inigo Jones and his pupil John Webb. Uh, on the right is an example of a mezzotint. Tint. Uh, he has quite a few mezzotint um, uh, by John Smith, the great English mezzotinter, um, the first Englishman to really get a continental um, reputation. And this one showing uh, the friend Edward Suzzle, who wrote to him from Rome. Um, as I went through the library, I started opening volumes of Pope and discovering that the frontispiece was a portrait of Pope given to him by Pope. Um, similarly, Clark's poetry opens up with a portrait of uh, so Matthew Pryor, who was ambassador in Paris and probably useful to Clark. Um, his poetry opens with a, with, a, with a portrait of Pryor that was the gift of the, uh, of, of the, of the poet. Um, and this is another example of one of those albums of Clark's where the prints are, um, they're not on backing sheets, they're on kind of hinges and you've just got the full sheet of, of, of paper bound into, a, into an album. Um, he had himself tried to be the first to get the Raphael cartoons uh, published. Um, he, he sponsored Charles Jarvis, uh, the painter, uh, who made copies of the cartoons at um, Hampton Court. Um, and uh, Clark bought the copies uh, and sent, sponsored Jarvis to go on uh, a trip to Paris and then to Rome uh, with a commission for Jarvis to ask Gerard Audron to engrave them. Gerard Audron being one of the 
then uh, pre Dorigny, um, one of the greatest engravers around. Um, and Audrey actually completed two of them, but then war broke out and then Audrey died. Uh, and Clark had a hell of a job to get his paintings back. So, um, what were the influences on Clark? Uh, I've mentioned Florent Le Comte's uh, Cabinet de Singularité of architecture, sculpture, painting, and engraving. Um, but this was the first great guide for print collectors, um, stressing the value of collecting prints, stressing the superiority of the contemporary French school and especially of the uh, of the Cabinet du Roi. He, he stresses the idea that all great men and all great, all men of style love prints because it was through prints that they could learn about all the best creations of ancient and modern culture. And this is what Clark's collection is all about. Cette passion d'estampes qui est une des principales marques des beaux esprits. Um, so he's really selling prints as, as something that all men of taste go for, uh, decorate their houses with study, and that it represents through them that they can admire tout que l'antiquité a de, de plus merveilleux et le monde de plus singulier. Collecting prints is a key to knowledge. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Le Comte uh, produced uh, several catalogue resume of the works of uh, different painters. This is Monsieur Lebrun, um, and he helpfully tells you that um, where you can buy them. Sorry, I've slipped again. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Poilly's widow is uh, selling the works of Jean-Baptiste Poilly. Um, Gerard Audron has a, will sell you a huge collection of, uh, of, of Lebrun, as well as all sorts of other things listed on the right. His other great guide of about the same moment is Roger de Peel, uh, the art of painting which Clark had in French but which was usefully translated into English in 1706 and there is a key chapter of the usefulness and use of prints. de Peel stresses the role of prints in acquiring good taste. You can't afford a lot of good pictures, and if you can afford them, you can't put enough together to be able to study them at once to give you an idea of the real character of, of a particular artist. However, with prints, you can put loads of them together um, and you can compare them on a table and comparing several masters, several painters, several engravers, you can get a true idea of them by comparing one with another. And this is the way that you acquire taste, the quality for which Clark becomes famous, uh, and which is what causes him to be consulted in all building projects. Um, but taste is an absolutely key quality in the 18th century, something that is recognized as important and desirable. Uh, and prints therefore become important and desirable so that you can get taste. Uh, this is one of Clark's volumes of uh, Raphael and his school, similar style. Um, uh, and uh, this is print by Santa Pietro Santa Bartoli after Raphael, 1700, three sheets of paper, great big thing. And somewhere here, uh, you will see it on the list. This is a list, and I'm pretty sure it's a shopping list that Clark gave to Charles Jarvis uh, to buy things in Rome. Um, most of them are, can come straight from De Rossi, uh, the Gabinetto Farnese, Galerio Farnese, uh, uh, what's that? I can't see what it's done by court. Fabula de Psyche after Raphael, uh, the Disputer, the School of Athens, Eliodoro, um, the Logi of the Vatican, 
uh, with prices, and they're the prices of um, of pre seventeen hundred uh, uh, de Rossi catalogues. So Clark had probably seen one. Um, one thing you can't get from de Rossi is all the things of Salvatore Rosa that are etched by himself. I think about 50 sheets. Well, Clark has all the things by Salvatore Rosa that are etched by himself. The likelihood is that, uh, that Jarvis brought them home from Rome for him. Title page of one of the um, de Rossi catalogues giving you a list of all the things they do, beginning with charts and maps and going on to uh, buildings and uh, pictures and statues and portraits of cardinals. Um, and page 69 of the uh, 1714 catalogue, which shows you the adoration of the Magi, the print by uh, Pietro Santa Bartoli that uh, Clark bought, although its price has gone up by this stage, so he bought it uh, a little bit later. Um, and I was just noting down there is a print by oh, by um, Beatrice. Uh, De Rossi is still selling very, very old plates, which come out pretty worn. Uh, most of Clark's Renaissance prints are bought for the design rather than for the print. Um, uh, and are rather worn examples. Uh, I shall have to accelerate, but we're doing reasonably well. Um, the market in England. Well, some clearly Clark bought some of his stuff abroad, either through agents or by going there himself. But increasingly, from 1700, um, you could buy things in England. The market explodes. One of the reasons for the explosion is the introduction of the daily newspaper and of newspaper advertising, which allows sellers to make contact with a larger public, tell them where they can buy things and what they can buy. Um, so this advertisement of 1709 is one of the first placed by Joseph Smith, who worked from Inigo Jones's head in Exeter Change in the Strand, who was for a long period the most important importer of foreign prints. Uh, and he's just brought in a new collection of Italian and French prints. Uh, Titian, the Gallery of Luxembourg from uh, the Luxembourg Palace in Paris. The original Battles of Alexander, very expensive. The Landscapes of Poussin, again, prestige things. Um, and he's selling them for interior decoration, furniture rooms and staircases, as well as for collecting. Um, another print seller, Robert Halton in Pall Mall in 1710, again, the famous battle of the battles of Alexander, where these were copied over and over again, but um, at three feet deep and two broad uh, each on 13 sheets of paper. These are probably the originals um, in Holton stock. Uh, they could actually be bought quite cheaply in France originally um, uh, because the king sold them quite cheaply, uh, but their price goes up and up and up, especially once they're in England. Uh, likewise, the paintings in the Queen's palaces, noblemen's seats and various other things uh, where gentlemen and ladies may have their dirty yellow prints very well cleaned and cheap. Uh, this is one of Clark's um, Battles of Alexander, become rather tatty and it survives in a roll. Um, he is stretched out against one of his bookcases and you get a good sense of the size of it. Uh, on the left is what the individual plates are like. Uh, you have to cut them out and stick them together to get the full thing as Clark had it. You see that each one is three feet deep and two feet broad. Um, beautiful things. The quality of Gerard Audran's engraving became massively famous. He was famous as the greatest history painter. Uh, and it's the way that he manages to combine etching and engraving that uh, is most valued about his work. His expressive ability and um, inevitably, I'm not going to go 
long into it, I wrote an article about this, but there are um, a lot of English copies, much, much cheaper um, and very early. These two sheet copies were um, were uh, listed in Thomas Bowles's stock. And so these are for middling people, uh, people without the resources, without the 20 guineas to buy the real thing, uh, but who want nevertheless to show that they are up to date with the great achievements of modern culture. And, and so, you know, these are for middling people's houses for decoration, big prints for the wall. That's why so few of them survive. Um, you get uh, uh, another thing that takes off in this period is the auction, uh, both high quality auctions and low quality auctions. And one phenomenon is coffee house sales, where imported prints, uh, later on often the stock of John Overton or other major French print sellers, um, are sold in coffee houses or pubs. Um, 12 sets of French large Caesars, possibly the prints on the right, um, French coloured and fit for any person of quality's hall. You know, that the French is the thing to have um, and uh, right French and French coloured um, to show that you're right in the fashion. Uh, Clark, this is uh, a <laughs> made from a photocopy. Um, that thing of the ancient past of um, Clark's collection of auction catalogues uh, and dealers stock catalogues. Um, these have just been uh, this collection of books that's been brought in by P. Varenne of Seneca's Head. Um, you, conditions of sale, he that bids most is the buyer. You can tell the auction is a slightly unfamiliar thing still. Uh, but note towards the bottom on the right that Varenne is, uh, he's holding an auction here, but he also has a bookshop in the Strand, and that it, this also sells several fine prints, originals, Ceiling of Versailles, Ceiling of Saint-Cloud, the Gallery of Saint-Cloud, the Four Seasons. This stress on the enormous, you know, just how fashionable and how uh, desirable contemporary French art is. Uh, is the is a big theme of these things. Uh, another of Clark's uh, volumes. Uh, this is the stock of Adrian Bayman of Delft, uh, who once again is importing the Cabernet du Roi, all the things sold by the um, by the Louvre, by the uh, official French uh, printing house uh, in the Louvre and just the same thing as the Grand Escalier, the tapestries, the plaisir of the Chante by Israel Silvestre. Uh, it's a great long series of the Cabinet du Roi um, available for sale. Uh, Clark clearly bought from this catalogue, but I don't know how. Uh, and by 1725, the market in London is so buoyant um, Rome is almost devoid of decent prints and everything is on the market in London uh, at, to the point where major foreign collections um, are being sold on the London market because you're going to get a higher price in London than you will get in Paris or in Rome. Um, and this is interesting. This is the collection of the secretary uh, of, of uh, Abel Tessin Dallon, who may have been the illegitimate child of William II, but was certainly secretary to Queen Mary and then secretary to King William. Almost certain that Clark knew him. And he has a vast, huge and very, very superior collection of the kind that Anthony was talking about last week. Um, there's a whole series of recueil, of, of major recueil of, of woodcuts largely on the right, together with one of Marc Antonio. Interestingly, really, um, the, these are just the things that Clark doesn't have. Um, he doesn't throw any great zeal into trying to get fine Renaissance prints, but other collectors at the time clearly were going for them. 
nevertheless, at the bottom of the page, um, you see the Bataille d'Alexandre, the Plafond du Grand Escalier de Versailles, um, and I think these are all bound in red Morocco, as any proper ambassador ought to have them. Um, and other collections were brought over at the same time, uh, such as that of the Comte de Brienne, uh, who also had everything bound in red Morocco because he was uh, war secretary to Louis XIV, He'd given his collection to his son, the Bishop of Coutances, who had given it to the cathedral at Coutances, and they're now selling it, now in 1724, selling it on the London market to raise funds to repair the cathedral. And that's it. There, I'll leave it. Thank you.